without much ado, I would like to introduce Mark Weaver giving a presentation in honor of his father, Robert Weaver.
he was born here. His family was a railroading family. My grandfather, B.O. Uh, Weaver, was a uh, brakeman on the railroad. Uh, my grandfather, Edward Lillian Weaver, uh, decided, you know, the railroad was too dangerous. I'm going to go into the mercantile business. So he ran the Golden Rule store on West Main Street. And during that time, the circus would winter over here at the winter quarters, and a lot of the performers would come to the store. And so here's my dad, a little kid, and he's hearing Russian, he's hearing Hungarian, he's hearing Italian, he's hearing German, and he's seeing people juggling fruit, and he's watching people walk on their hands down the street. And he goes, this is an amazing thing. And he was totally captured by the people, the whole idea of the of the circus. It was an amazing thing to him. I love this picture uh, of the elephants coming down Broadway here. So this is what he was seeing and this is what never left him. And here did the great John Robinson cage wagon. Of course, as I mentioned, it's the first circus he likes. It's the John Robinson circus. There we go. Well, the next big step was his education. First, he had ideas of going to Purdue University to study engineering. He had great drafting skills. Imagine that. He was a good draftsman. <laughs> but he also enjoyed how things work. So he thought, oh, well, I think that's what I'm going to do. Well, he got bitten by the art of creative life. And he realizes, you know, I can do my drafting, but yet I can communicate something through art. So maybe I should go to the art. So he works, earns his first year's tuition to go to Heron School of Art, and he's accepted. And he joins the school in 1933. Uh, this picture is taken probably about 1936, 35. Uh, and there he is. I think this really captures him because he's, you notice he's right out in front actually further out in front than anybody else, and he has this huge smile on his face. And the man that you see here in the suit would turn out to be probably one of his greatest mentors. And that was Donald Magnus Madison, who had come to teach at Heron and he was director. He is a graduate of Yale University in New Haven, where I live now. Uh, and he had won the Prix de Rome, won the, won the preeminent country. Of course, there always had to be a performance with my dad. So here you see him with a fellow student in full clown makeup outside the art building and they're doing some kind of crazy pantomime or skit and much to the chagrin of uh, Mr. Madison who was not always so keen to what they were doing. Uh, but uh, it wasn't unusual for him to walk on his hands into his classroom. Uh, so the guy had circus in his blood and, and there was just no escaping him. So big things were happening. I want to remind everybody, uh, <laughs> I forgot this and I thought this was a pretty neat little uh, so he was born in November of 1913. Does anybody know what happened nine months before that in Peru? A big event. Flood? The flood. Okay. So I figured out, he's a flood baby. Yeah. <laughs> I know what my grandparents were doing. Like. <laughs> 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 in 1913. But anyway, we didn't want to let that go away. What about the pines? Yeah, exactly. Like people are also about the pines. Exactly right. <laughs> Uh, so one of the big things that uh, the director, uh, Mr. Madison, was pushing the students to do at Heron was to enter national competitions. Uh, he wanted them to enter the Prix de Rome competition. He wanted them to enter the Milliken Prize. For my father, he wanted him to enter the John Armstrong Challenger Prize, which at the time was the top prize for painters, for specifically painters. 
the Prix de Rome, you can be a writer, you can be a sculptor, you can be the you know, paint, you know, several different disciplines. But the Challenger Prize is specifically for painting. And what that prize was comprised of was two years of a studio, all expenses paid in New York City. This is the Depression, I remember. Uh, two years of overseas study and a $6,000 stipend wow. in 1937. Wow. And I looked it up, $6,000 in 1937 would have had the same purchase power as $125,000 today. Wow. So it was a major, major prize. And he wins it. Much to everybody's surprise, I think Mr. Madison was not necessarily that surprised. He thought he had the talent. He thought he would do very well. Mm -hmm. And uh, what happened was he made it through all the initial rounds. He gets into the final round, and there's a tie. The other artist's name was Bernie Quick from Minnesota that he tied with. And the painting that he was in the tie for was this is his final round painting that he did, which is now in the Han Museum of uh, Indiana Art in Lafayette, Indiana. Um, and so the judges said, okay, we've got two great people here that we can't decide who we want. So we're gonna have a paint off and we're gonna give them a certain amount of time to get this done and then we're gonna adjudicate on the jury were the fantastic American uh, painter Gifford Beale and the sculptor Von Heinrich Young, who was actually Brigham Young's grandson. Oh. Uh, but you know, very famous artist at the time. Uh, they finally decided, okay, it's time for to work in. Let's see what you've come up with. My dad never let anything go a story. So he said, I'm going to throw in a kicker. I'm going to throw in an extra penny. Just for fun. And that was the writing of clowns that you see here. So this was the, the extra one that he did. This is the winning painting. And it's lost. We have no idea who it is. The uh, way it says the lamp there, it was used for the quarterly report for the Standard Oil Company of America. And they used it on their cover. <laughs> it's the only color image that we have of it left in America. So if you see this, <laughs> it's around, it's around somewhere. Uh, the last time we heard that somebody saw it down in West Bay, Indiana. Well, that is all maybe. I don't know. <laughs> so he wins the prize. He gets a studio in New York. And he begins to paint. Serious. This is the same time when you see him looking out the window and wondering what's going to happen next. And he comes up with some of his greatest works. Wagon 97, I'm sure none of you have ever seen because it sold out of the Grand Central Galleries in New York. Uh, in 1938, he was made a life member of the Grand Central Galleries. He was picked as one out of uh, four. Three got picked that year. There were 400 applicants. Mm -hmm. And he was one of them that got picked. So that's now in a private collection that just sold at uh, 70s, uh, probably about five years ago. Uh, remember the price? Say again? Do you remember the price? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I had owned it. <laughs> yeah, it, it actually, it was funny how this thing surfaced because I only had a in the picture of it. And I had just come off of a tour with the group I used to play with. And uh, the phone rings, it's like 9 o'clock at night, and I'm going, who is that? And of course, I pick it up, and I said, yes. And is this Martin Beard? Is this the son of Martin Beard? And I said, uh, yes. And she goes, this is so and so. So and so at Spaniard Gallery in New York City. And we have a painting by your father. I go, really? So well, which one? And she goes, Wagon 97. I said, oh my God. I said, I have no idea where that's been, but I knew about it. And I said, I've never seen it. And uh, 
So <laughs> there was the owner of the gallery bought it at auction at Christie's uh, for a nice amount of money from a collector Paul Colson, who was a major collector in New York City. And he was the guy who bought it out of the, the shop that it was in. And, uh, and they traveled all over the place. It was part of the uh, American Federation of the Arts tours that they used to do during the War Depression. Uh, so I went to the Pennsylvania Academy, the Corcoran Gallery in Washington, Chicago Art Institute. It got all over the place. So it was a really pedigree piece. And Ira bought it and he sold it for a ridiculous amount of money, which <laughs> I wish I had owned it. <laughs> anyway, uh, uh, the other painting here, which was very important that he did in his studio, uh, was writing Hannaford's, which is now at the uh, International Service Hall of Fame. And that was just recently exhibited as part of the Bicentennial Exhibition at the Indiana State Museum for Indiana Artists, for the top Indiana artists of the last uh, 200 years. And uh, it's a beautiful condition. It looks like the day it was painted and it's being very well cared for. So I'm very happy about that. Uh, but you notice the, the coloration here. This is a, uh, I'll talk a little bit more about the different styles over his, his working life. Uh, the coloration is very rich. Uh, the scarlets are very, you know, bright. Uh, the, beautiful earth tones, the light, he always had this ability with light, and you know, the critics at that time noticed it. They said, this is somebody who was really talented. 